Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of What Makes You Click. I'm really pleased today to have with me Turid Rugas, who will be known to many of you because of her work on dog calming signals. Now, every now and then, you know, great science be begins with a great observation, and, and that's what Turid's uh, conceptualization of um, calming signals are. And uh, uh, she actually been with dogs for a very long time. I, um, I can see on Wikipedia when it says you, when you got your first dog, which, um, but you started training dogs in 1969, shall we say? <laughs> Something like that, yes. <laughs> and um, as I said, I've still got the, 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 the old videotape version of your calming oh signals that I got when it first came out. Um, <laughs> okay. And, you know, it's one of those things that has just completely taken off, but there is so much more to Turid than calming signals, and we will talk about that. But first of all, let me start by saying welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Oh, that's and, nice. I'm happy to be here. And, um, <laughs> you know, just a measure of Turid's contribution to the field is uh, in 2017, she was awarded the King's Badge of Honour. Uh, from the King of Norway for her contributions to dog training. And there can't be too many people who get given awards by monarchy for their contributions to animal training. So um, uh, that's sort of a, a, quite an amazing a achievement. So, and I know Turret has interests well beyond dogs as well. I really don't know where we're going to go. Um, I did notice that there is a sort of semi biographical film about you called A Boat Trip with Tour Root Girls, which I haven't seen. Um, but um, let me start with that, because I haven't seen it. So I know this is... Um, so, so what goes on in that movie? How did that come well, about, even? You know, my friends uh, from uh, Italy, uh, the Hakihana uh, company who is uh, making the harnesses that we promote, uh, for for dogs, uh, they are into a lot of things, and they also made all the videos I I have out seven in all I think, and uh, then they got the bright idea to have uh, something like a kind of biography about me, and uh, when they want something, they get it usually. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, and they wanted to. They asked me uh, what was typical for. Norwegian people and I I just it bumped out of me uh, sea water they are sailors they go to sea they explore <laughs> and that's why they came up with the idea to take it as a boat trip with me <laughs> I'll tell you I, I love the idea of you know a few of us getting together on a, a cruise ship going around the Norwegian fjords and just chatting spending a few days just chewing the fat that would be a great um, idea but um, I think they thought more about Vikings than anything else <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a lot of Viking blood in the in the UK I live in a part of the country called the Dane law which is where the Danish ones okay. settled the Norwegians one tended to go further north uh, up to Scotland and uh, yeah. um, I think the Danish ones were more the farmers and the uh, Norwegians were more the marauders that went around a lot uh, yeah uh, I guess yeah <laughs> So, um, so I started the introduction, and I, I will go into this. But there's, as I said, there's lots of other things that I'd like to um, chat about. You know, and, you know, one of the things I feel very strongly is science is not the preserve of academics sitting in universities. Um, although I'm one of those, um, but but you know, great science starts with an observation, and mm. uh, you know. In, it was sort of, I think the book came out in the early '90s, whatever. But um, you know, where did? And it's it's not about the observation. It's it's actually articulating the observation, and starting to ask the questions and explore it that sort of makes the great science. And I'm I'm just intrigued to know where, if you know at all, where the idea of sort of calming signals came from. Uh, I don't really know because. Uh... I have a rare gift, one gift. I'm not talented in many things, but I am an observer. And I was born an observer. I cannot even brag about it because I was just born like that. I spent uh, hours uh, from I was three years old lying in the garden observing uh, hedgehogs. I could spend hours and hours just observing them. So of course, uh, 
while you are observing animals, you start to see things and you start to see things that repeat themselves. So up through the years, uh, I noticed a lot of things and I uh, understood very early that that animals actually communicate in a way. And I observed and I observed and I went on and on with it. And then finally, I got the chance of doing something real about it when I took a, um, an instructor course with the one person you know, veterinary Overden from Norway. And he uh, set me off to a few things and let me do observations. And after that course, uh, when other of the students and I, we, we actually sat down to find out about um, the language of dogs. Because in all the books we got, they were very old from the 1930s. You know, all these old uh, ethology books. Uh, they always said that wolves have some aggression calming signals, but dogs do not have them. And we got fired up by that because I had seen it all my life. So I was sure about it, but I didn't know exactly how. So we decided to uh, start uh, doing something about it. And we spent two years filming and observing and taking notes. And I think we observed something like two, two and a half thousand dogs during that time. And in the end, we sat down with an enormous amount of information that we tried to pack together. And then we found out a lot of things that dogs actually did, had in common. And that was very common. They used it all the time. So that it was a long, long uh, development actually, but it ended up in something that we really went for. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, I, I didn't realize that the books talked about the sort of signals in wolves that said that dogs didn't have them. But I think mm. it's one of those things, isn't it, that I, I don't think it's any surprise that a number of these um, things happen with people outside, sort of um, often outside some of the main academic centers, because mm. sometimes in academia, there's this very narrow view and I mean, yeah. I, I, you know, I, ignorance is bliss. When I moved into academia in the sort of mid nineties, I had no idea that watching dogs wasn't considered biology, but it wasn't, you know, mm -hmm. farm animals were just sort of seen as a sort of pseudo biology, yeah. but they were domesticated yeah. animals. And the idea of studying dogs was just sort of, um, sort of, well, no serious scientist would do that. Yeah. And, you know, People have thought it strange, and we got a lot of uh, pepper for it, and also people just laughed at about nonsense and stuff like that. I remember I met you at a conference in the UK, at uh, the uh, in one of the first years I was lecturing about it, and there were a lot of people there who thought I was a complete idiot. <laughs> yeah, it's. I mean. I... It's, yeah, it's funny because I, I remember meeting you in, in the UK. I can't remember which conference it was, but yeah, I remember chatting yeah, I think to you. I it was APDT or something. Okay, yeah, yeah, may well have been. And I just yeah. remember sort of listening and thinking, yeah, you're onto it. And, and like you, you know, um, and it reminds me, the same with Ian Dunbar, you know, and, and, and a few of the other people that I've done these podcasts with. Yeah, it's, as you say, it's being an observer. And I, Ian used to talk about, he wasn't very sociable. He'd just go across the field with, you know, and, and there was a farmer yeah. that sort of taught him how to observe. And I, I often sort of joke, I'm the youngest of five kids. My two brothers were born first, my two sisters. Um, then there was a little bit of a gap and then I arrived. So I had to play with the dogs. And, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> so, you know, I, and I guess that's where my sort of interest in, yeah, observation came from. I was quite happy just yeah. watching. Um, and and I, I still am, you know, with my photography and stuff now that I just like going out and watching wildlife. I can quite happily sit there for hours on end watching stray dogs or stray cats, much to my uh, family's yeah. disdain on holidays. <laughs> Dad, we've been here 20 minutes. <laughs> but, uh, I, I've spent a lot of time with my students uh, trying to teach them how to observe, but I realized that uh, it's hard to learn to be a good observer if you don't have it from, from birth. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting you should say that because there is a study that was done by the Finnish group 
which showed that people that, that people who seem to sort of have a more natural way with dogs when they observe dog dog interactions they use the same bit of the brain as when they observe human human interactions and people who are not skilled um uh, dog observers yeah just don't do it you know mm. they, they 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 have to use a different bit of the brain and it's so much harder and so stuff that somebody like yourself is just intuitive it's just mm. not you know the the brain isn't wired up for it for them and that mm. makes it really hard no I've actually, I've had a couple of PhD students where we've tried an experiment about teaching um, dog body language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, it just doesn't, it just hasn't worked whenever we've tried it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, we give, we, we, I think the, in the first one, I, mean, we, I think in both of them, we gave people videos and these are different PhD students. Um, and we gave them a framework to try and understand what was going on. We made the observations, etc., and then you present them with some other things. And, and if you ask them the theory, they can do it, but you give them the video mm. and mm. they just don't do it. Um, and it, yeah, it's fascinating because you think, well, you know, they can say what they need to see when you, <laughs> you, and you ask them, but you give them a video and they don't actually process it. I don't know if you've got mm. any thoughts about, you know, how we can teach people better observation skills. As you say, it, there obviously is that intuitive element, but if you want to reduce the risk um, to people from dogs, then people mm. have got to become yeah. better observers. But maybe they just don't spend enough time with dogs. I don't know. I, I think uh, what I see is uh, I have had so many people for training that uh, I have started to see a kind of pattern and it's possible to teach anybody just a few things. Don't expect them to see everything, uh, but they can learn to start to see a few things and concentrate on that. And they might get a little better saving something more. And I think that's a good start actually. And mm. that might be good enough because they get the idea of looking at the dog and seeing what the dog is trying to say. Mm. Yeah, so no. uh, it's a compromise. You know, I think it, you're, you're probably right. Just do it in stages. It's a little bit like, um, yeah, you know, teaching somebody to to write a, a decent essay. If they don't know how to write an mm. introduction, they don't know how to write methods. You can't expect them to do it all in one go. You have to teach each of yeah. those skills separately. In the most recent study, we actually combined it with assessment of risk. And that's where we did see some change. Well, after sort of, um, after the training, then people did become, well, they seem to, the, the more professional people actually became more cautious, which um, I don't think is a bad mm. thing um no no definitely not because I, I i a lot of scientific people who are not really very good at observing i'm sorry to say no i i, I don't <laughs> know i think you're spot on i think um I, one of my concerns with a lot of scientists is that they've become very formulaic um mm. you know this is the way you do science and that's mm. why i say you know some of the it's not surprising that you know that some of the sort of big advances are happening outside very traditional areas because mm. there's a snobbery um and a, a great you know people are very conservative and trying to get funding they seem to want mm. to know what the results are going to be before you even do it so ambitious science and you know mm. these yeah. sorts of breakthroughs just don't happen yeah. Um, uh, you know, I wanted very much to uh, to study ethology when I was young, but we didn't have it in Norway yet. It came ten years after I was a student. <laughs> but uh, but uh, in a way, I'm glad that I didn't do it because uh, I wouldn't like to turn my observing brain uh, into more scientific things. I I think it would have spoiled it in a way. There's a danger, I think, and, and like you, you know, I, I went to vet school and I was sort of self-taught in behaviour. I, I went to um, psychology lectures just because I hated the vet course, to be honest. Um, but, but by virtue of reading vast amounts of stuff, I, I got different perspectives. And then as I started mm -hmm. to meet academics in the field, you started to realise that some people seem to be drilled in a particular way 
other people mm. drilled in a different way and they couldn't see each other's points of view mm. i've always um tended to think of uh you know as by virtue of being a vet I always thought I don't know much about anything, but I know a little bit about lots of bits of biology and, and being in a life sciences department, I can often act as a sort of focus for, you know, people to have conversations from different fields. But I think the same goes, as I said, it's surprising in the behavior field how some people are so, in a way, it's as if they've got an enormous confidence in their methods without realizing just how yeah, limited yeah. they are and the blind spots that there are. Mm. Um, in many ways I'm very glad I'm Norwegian because we are a bit hard-headed and stubborn when we do something and uh, I have got my uh, my share of it mm. and I'm very glad for that because uh, it's been quite hard to to keep on going with what I really believed in yeah and, and uh, yeah yeah and I, I, I do believe in it yeah, yeah and I, as I said I can I, I, I remember that first conference in the UK and I can remember people saying, oh, you know, yeah, what's she on about? <laughs> and I just thought, you don't get it, do you? Um, and again, you know, I think there is a, there is sometimes a snobbery as well. That What can somebody outside academia tell us about? And you think, oh, for goodness sake. <laughs> you know? And a very, very new way of thinking. So uh, mm. uh, that was also hard for some people to see it in a totally different way. Mm. and I can understand that in many ways but I'm glad you have persisted um because mm. as I said I, I it's one of those things which I think has it's had such a big impact on dog welfare etc and you know there mm. must be tremendous satisfaction that comes with that yeah but, uh, you know I'm so surprised how uh, how it went uh, so well because my book is still selling by the thousands every year I live from my royalties actually, and that is quite enormous yeah. because uh, I didn't even want to write the book. It was Terry Ryan uh, from US who who pushed me into it, and I said nobody will read that book, but they have. Everybody they have. should read the book. Every dog owner should read the book. It's a, it's I've got it here. It's a little book, <laughs> that's um, great. And, and that's great. You know, there's no excuse for somebody not reading this book. Um, <laughs> It's quite and, easy to read also. It's quite yeah. small. So. <laughs> and, and I mean, and Terry actually says, you know, I, I think it's Terry that says in, in the beginning, or it might be in your introduction, you know, forget too much about labels, just observe. And again, mm -hmm. you know, that's the key thing. And I know, you know, from some of the work that I've done sort of, and you know, I say, well, you know, exactly what this tells us, exactly what's going on, you know, just that's a different question what you first of all have to do is observe these occurring in certain contexts and use that information uh, at a practical level but yeah. um, and you know i i'm still observing i can't mm. help it so uh, me and my daughter has also started to be interested in it so we have uh, observing days where we just decide to go out and sit somewhere for maybe two hours and observe a certain thing in all the dogs passing. Mm. It's 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 amazing. And also one thing that comes out of that is that I see uh, how things change uh, in the society because what we saw uh, when we noticed, uh, observed the dogs, uh, let's say 20 years ago is different from what I see today. In what ways? Just, that, um... that is really interesting. Um, I remember that uh, earlier it was quite uh, normal to uh, to let the dogs just walk around and and sniff and look around and they were friendly to everybody. Today there are so many dogs who are tense uh, to other dogs or people. Mm -hmm. because they go on a tight leash, yeah. they are pulled away, uh, and they get all this negative information about uh, the world around them. Yeah, I know. I think, I think you're spot on. And it's something which, um, yeah. And <laughs> there's a couple of things, you know, and I think, because uh, we've been doing some work on social greeting in, in dogs as well. And I was, mm. I was actually chatting to my students about it, that one of the things that has come with the sort of promotion of socialization 
is an unrealistic expectation that a socialized mm. dog is completely bomb proof and you should be able to do everything with it which mm. again you know um you know it, it, that's just unrealistic there's you know there's not a human on the planet who hasn't lost their temper from time to time yeah. I, I was so happy to hear a couple of lectures from the neurologist uh, Jenny Nieberg from Sweden, and she she was really brilliant. And uh, she she al always told us that uh, the best way for any dog to uh, overcome any kind of fear or skepticism is to let him have a choice. Don't mm -hmm. interfere. Let him have a choice. Let him look. Let him find out what to do about it. And I was so happy because that's what I always done with my dogs. And mm. I think that's the best way. Leave them to it. Uh, try to have a little distance maybe for some dogs, but leave them to it. Choices. Let them find out. Yeah. They're uh, smart. Absolutely. And, you know, yeah, their brains will work it out. And as you say, mm. people... Uh, you know one of the common things you see now is yeah dogs on very short leads um mm -hmm. owners who seem to want to control everything and just don't give the dog yeah some time we did i had an undergraduate student a number of years ago and we looked at um a, sort of dogs investigating scents. so we gathered pee from a number of dogs and put it around the campus and asked mm -hmm. people to walk their dogs and in one of them we sort of looked at we gave the dog as much time as it wanted and it was it was the same dog's pee in several places mm. um and um uh, and you know with time what you find is the dog just ignores the scent in the other mm. i think it was after five seconds they pulled the dog away and of course the dog goes through mm. all of the scents because he's never got all the information it's like sort of mm you know interrupting someone before they can finish a sentence they want to start the sentence again each time mm. and I, I, it's, it's i've been chatting to colleagues recently about this that again there is this danger this rise in over control now we have to keep people yeah. safe absolutely yeah and i think that is uh, what we have seen building up uh, through many years now it, it is about more and more and more control Mm. And uh, I struggle with uh, with my clients to try to teach them to let go of that control, uh, relax a little bit, mm. let the dog have a chance. Mm. And you see results so quickly when the dog feels that he is not under control all the time. Nobody yeah. wants to be that. No, not people, not dogs, no, nobody. Well, the thing is, if you if you if you control your dog, by definition, your dog doesn't have much control. So your dog is constantly mm. frustrated. You know, mm. he has no sense that he has any agency in the world. Now, I'm not saying mm. that, you know, dogs have high philosophical concepts of agency, but, you know, even an amoeba has control mm. over its environment mm. to a degree. Mm. Um, yeah. it's, a, it's a shame that there's been so much of it. Uh, and I, I've seen this... Uh, there's a difference in cultures because I have been going to so many countries I mean courses I've seen the culture differences and uh, I'm afraid to say that uh, there are certain countries who have been really uh, giving this uh, control thing to the rest of the dog world and I hope uh, it will change again because it's no good not good at yeah. all yeah there's I mean... so many uh, learned helpless dogs that doesn't seem to know what to do when they, when nobody yeah. tell them what to do. And it, yeah, it's it's incredibly stressful for them as, as a result. Um, something really bizarre has happened. And before we started this recording, you know, I said there was a there was an issue. I've also got a thing flashing up on me that they're going to close this down in a few minutes. So I might have to <laughs> we might have to take a break in about five minutes and okay. and reconnect. Um, just just so you know. Uh, the joys of doing these things but i don't know this this must be a new thing in zoom that's just happened oh uh, okay okay um so if we suddenly get cut off then uh, as i said we'll, we'll do this in several parts i think um but mm -hmm. so picking up on that um uh that point you know the other thing which i know you do a lot of is about using more yeah what we might call natural methods in training and I, I'm increasingly concerned, and I don't want this to be misunderstood, 
you know, using positive reinforcement is a, is a good thing, but people's over-dependence on the use of food as a reward. Oh, and God. taking we, away... We don't use that. Yeah. It's and, uh, not good. And, and we don't use it much, very little, because dogs don't need that for every step they take. And it's it just is a distraction. I find that in most cases, uh, giving treats is a distraction. Yeah. Well, the, the, the thing to me, the big concern is if you give treats, you take away the intrinsic reward of the task. You know, yep. if, if you apply out external rewards, then the inner value of it, and there's loads of work that's been done in the human field in, in this yeah. area. And, you know, I increasingly see people who can have very obedient dogs, enormous amount of control over them, quite apart. But equally, these dogs have got no resilience because they're just they, no. they don't seem to get any real pleasure out of life because they're just constantly looking for the, the treat. No, and uh, definitely they don't, um, they're not good in doing what dogs do because dogs are pack animals. They are wonderful uh, family members. They, they will look after the kids. They will uh, participate in whatever is going on. They, they love to be and do things together with you mm, so that, that's the best part of it and this idea that sort of you know dog does a recall give it a food treat no he's come to you it's a social behavior give him a social reward spend some time, you know quality time with it. i don't even teach dogs recall because when i get a dog in my house i walk with him and i change direction and dogs are so visual they see immediately when something is moving and when you change direction, they also do. So I use a lot of body language mm -hmm. to make the communication with them, and it works 10 times better. So that makes me wonder, because one of the ways that, yeah, with dogs pulling on the lead is a thing I call switch walking, where you sort of constantly changing direction. And the dog very rapidly learns that actually the only way to work out where you're going is to be one step behind you and if I'm one step behind you I'm not pulling on the lead and I'm just wondering if I pick that up from you because I don't know where I got it from no <laughs> but it's that uh, changing we, of direction uh, we find that almost every client coming to us they need to learn to walk the dog because nobody seems to be able to and then we take away all the treats they have they're not allowed to use it and then we teach them to walk slow enough for the dog to walk instead of running all the time, because then they just have to run to follow and they don't see anything around them. So they have to walk slowly and then we walk along and once in a while change direction. And it's, it's so lovely to see how the dog immediately also changes his body in that direction. He might stand sniffing the ground, but he changes so we can follow when it's finished with the sniffing. And it's just Fantastic. so much more relaxed as well. Yeah. With it all. So using body language and movement is so much more efficient mm. instead yeah. of all these uh, commands that people are using. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I, I agree with you entirely. What a lot of people won't know is that you started um, your professional career as a horse trainer is, is that correct oh yeah oh yes i grew up uh, just beside the racing course in oslo and uh, my uncle was a trainer there so uh, my first memories from uh, animals is horses and they were my great love from the beginning actually so uh, yeah i've done a lot with horses mm. So, I mean, were you, were you training racehorses or were you training? No, um, actually, I didn't have much to do physically with horses till I was adult, because in those days, girls were not very welcome in the stables. They were not tough enough for, for the work with horses. Then that changed very much. But uh, I was adult when I started to learn to ride. I was a little late and then I got the chance of taking an instructor class, riding instructor class uh, by the military because they, the cavalry was being put down in Norway and they spent the last years 
educating civilians in uh, working with the horses, which I'm really grateful for because they were really good. I learned a lot. So, 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 you, so you weren't, although you were sort of with the Norwegian uh, cavalry, you, you weren't employed, you weren't in the Norwegian army, is that right? <laughs> well, we were not in the army, but uh, uh, they had groups, uh, uh, you know, teaching us like we were in a short old mini army or something, uh, because I wanted civilians to learn about horses. There were no horses in Norway after the Second World War because the Germans took them all. So we, we started scratch with a few uh, horses and there were no races, there were nothing like that at all. So it was uh, a lot of knowledge that went lost. So I remember, again, it would be sort of early 90s going to Norway to a horse conference. And, and I never thought about that, but yeah, after the war, um, uh, sort of yeah the, the the loss of the horses and I went they took us on a trip to sort of the breeding centers of some of the national yeah. breeds so okay not only the Norwegian Fjord but uh this is Dor uh, Nord 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 um Nor uh, Northland horse yeah yeah, I mean, an amazing place. But it also explains the great pride that they had, it, it, I guess, because I, I guess, yeah. you know, they nearly lost yeah. all of these breeds um, because of it. So, yeah. Um, when I started a riding school briefly in 1972, I think it was, um, actually, we had big trouble getting horses there. So we started with just two, three horses. It was impossible. We had to get a couple from Denmark. Mm -hmm. And that was really troublesome. There were no horses around yet. But then it started gradually to build up. And now we have horses everywhere, I think. <laughs> That's a nice way to be, isn't it? So what about calming signals in horses? What are your oh, thoughts yeah. there? <laughs> oh, yes. They have them too. Yeah, and I think I, I've got feelings. Somebody just produced a book. I know it was my <laughs> student. She took my dog trainer education, and then when she was going to make uh, her who uh, annual uh, work essay, uh, she she asked uh, what I asked her what she was interested in, and she's and she said the horses, and I said okay. You can, uh, for instance, look at uh, calming signals in horses, and she just took it like that. So she started after the, the course to work on it, and she has done a brilliant job. She has uh, published a book on the calming signals in horses, mm. and she has also published a book about uh, nose work with mm. horses, mental stimulation. So uh, she has, uh, and she was just here visiting me last week uh, because we are good friends and we see each other all the time and we love to talk about horses as well. Yeah. So, so, so why did she write the book and not you? Because <laughs> given that you, you, you must have known, you must have known about these signals for a long time. She, she is more, um, what shall we say, scientific in a way. Okay. And she wanted to do it. And I didn't really have time because mm. I was working 24-7 yeah. at that time. So mm. I was happy to let her do it, and she's done a brilliant job. Okay. I could Absolutely. never have done it as well as she did it. Yeah, and it's, it's again, it, going back to what we were talking about earlier with dogs, I mean, horses are such a victim of people not giving them time to work it out. They are victims, yes, definitely. Yeah. And I hate to see it. And I mean, when I was riding, I mostly rode without reins. I, yeah. I, I just used my body and my mm. weight and everything. And it, it was so much pleasant in a way to do it a little more natural and easy. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I remember when I was, I, I took one of my sons with me to Brazil and we, we, I mean, yeah, we had reins, but we were neck reining, and it was just sort of yeah. so much nicer than. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it it is really a pain for a horse to have all this gear in his mouth and being pulled. That it's it's painful. Well, one of the telltale uh, things when you've got um, sometimes with horses that have got head shaking, and you recommend a bitless bridle to people, and say, yeah. "But I feel I've got no control." And you're thinking. 
in which case you probably shouldn't have been riding the horse in the first no, place. <laughs> exactly. That's what I also told people. If you feel insecure on the horse, you shouldn't be riding. You have to learn more about uh, yourself and how to ride. Hmm. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I agree. Yeah. No. So do you have horses where you are now? Not now, because uh, my last horse died uh, a few years ago. And I'm too old to get any new yeah. ones. That's not fair to the horse. Uh, I hate that uh, to know that I have to go to someone else. I hate that. Yeah, I mean, it's. But you used to do long distance riding, is that right? Yes, yes. Uh, I also did a few other things, uh, more or less for fun. But, mm. uh, you know, I'm not a competitive person, so I never take things very no. seriously. When no, I, 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 know, I, know the, I know the feeling, but... Um, but that, that again, you know, I just, I wish people had to sort of take a test of controlling the horse or working with the horse, controlling isn't the right word, working mm. with the horse yeah. on the ground before they're allowed to get on a horse's back. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. You I, know, in the beginning, I was uh, doing some horses. I was in Sweden on a trip and I got in touch with some old, really old cavalrists. Mm. from the Swedish army and one of them he, he had a lovely chat and he said take it easy in the beginning when you get a horse walk him the first year trot him the next and then you have a horse that lasts a lifetime and uh, of course that was a bit uh, maybe easy but yes I've kept that with me and I think we should do the same with dogs they should be taken very, very gently in the beginning. They need time to build up. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. And uh, it's just, well, yeah, whether people is, they just need to calm down themselves as well. Mm. Mm. Um, but it's, yeah, I, I like that idea that, um, yeah, for the first two years of, um, of life. I had uh, a friend who was an archaeozoologist and she used to say, if ever they find, you know, a horse skeleton in an in a archaeological dig, um, they want to know whether or not it's domesticated or not. She just says, have you got any of the spine? Because if, <laughs> if you've got the spine, it's got arthritis, then I know somebody's been on its back. Yeah, yeah. Which, I know it's I mean it I'm, I'm so proud to say that both the horses I had till they were 28 years wow. they had really straight and yeah. healthy backs yeah uh, to the very end and yeah. I was really proud of that yeah and I just I mean I'm, I, I love horses but I don't ride because I feel sorry for I feel sorry for a horse yeah. with me on their back actually yeah and my my wife uh, used to be a, a gymnast and so she's got great balance um yeah. but I, I I'm like a sack of potatoes and people often used to say that but um <laughs> but it's, it's nice sort of when you got the. Uh, I think it's good to be beside them you get more contact with them that way so I always start in, in the beginning by walking beside them and uh, did it a lot later also mm. so I like dogs I like cats and I like horses so cats, where do you stand on cats? I don't think I've ever asked you about cats. <laughs> That's really ridiculous. I like cats. I have had cats and I like them, but I don't understand them. And I, you know, my daughter has a cat now and I, I just don't, don't understand what to do with that cat, honestly. So that is a bit mystery to me. <laughs> I think the secret with the cat is not to try to do much with it, but let it do what it wants to you. <laughs> they do what they do, and that's yeah, it. <laughs> we've got a new cat, um, and it's a rescue. And it's the, the previous cats we've had all, always seem to have had some sort of musculoskeletal problem for various okay. reasons. And we've got this relatively young male cat who is just fit and we're just not used to the cat being everywhere but um but they certainly change your your home yeah. at the at the farm that i lived in for 40 years uh, we had cats and they seemed to multiply funny enough so at some point we had 14 of them yeah. but you know they lived like a family mm. The, the sisters and aunts and uncles took care of the newborn kittens oh, wow. and it was just like a family and nobody believes me because I say cats are not like that but they did. 
Mm. Well, it, it's an interesting one. We've we've been doing some work on that, and there's two aspects to sociability in cats, and I think they often get confused. And uh, I think you know the same applies to dogs and horses as well. There is. And we were talking earlier about socialization. Now, socialization allows you to accept things mm. and, you know, to see, be part of your social group. And yes, it's very important. But there is the temperament trait associated with um, how sociable you are. And the same, and we, mm. we recognize it much more in cats now that there are certainly some cats that are temperamentally much more likely to be loners. Now, if you socialize them they'll get on with one or two people and that would you know they, they won't be um, disruptive but they're not gregarious you know they're not in big group but then there's an at the other end there is this very very social trait mm. you know like so like there are dogs. differences in it uh, in different uh, and if you socialize those then they will quite happily live in large groups mm. and and tolerate each other and and more than mm. tolerate each other um and I remember um, John Bradshaw saying uh, about sort of, well, one of the things with cats and domestication is we never selected for sociability. And he reckoned, you know, we could very quickly um, sort of turn this around. And I remember being slightly skeptical of his sort of time frames. But now that I've started to look into it, you think it is actually there in the population. Now, you know, mm -hmm. people are not going to do that sort of selective breeding in cats mm. unfortunately but um but there are you know a lot of people want that hyper social cat um and uh, it's more, socialization isn't going to give it to you if the cat isn't genetically predisposed and i think the same mm. goes with dogs you know whilst the vast majority of dogs are very social you get some dogs that just want to be much more I, I don't know. Maybe it has to do with the, the environment uh, oh. you have, because uh, all our animals seem to be very social at the farm because we just accepted them as part of the family. Cats, horses, yeah. and rabbits, whatever. The, it was amazing. Well, again, it goes back to what we were saying earlier, just giving them the time to work it out and realize yeah. this isn't yeah. a threat. Yeah. And if it's not it a threat... It was a great then... time, actually. It yeah. was. Um, <laughs> I went uh, many years ago. I went to. Do you know Martha Kylie Worthington? Uh, what? The... Martha, Martha Kylie Worthington. Do you know Martha? No. Okay. So she's um, she's written some stuff on uh, horses as well, but she's um, she's one of these people who's not afraid to challenge the status quo with her views on um, ethology and, okay. uh, and the like. And I went to visit her once with um, an American friend who just arrived in the country, and we had. Uh, basically the meal in her multi-species living room and yeah you know there were llamas and chickens <laughs> the chicken was not on the mm. table as a dish it was just on the table eating <laughs> that was, it was quite a uh, an eclectic mix shall we say um, quite a memorable mm. experience for somebody who just arrived from America this was her first experience mm. with the Brits <laughs> I, I think it is fantastic to see when uh, when old, uh, what shall we say, knowledge and instincts pop up in our domesticated animals, because very often we don't really see it because I don't have any chance to use it. Uh, I was a stable manager for 17 uh, horses for a long time. And in the summer, they were let out in huge areas in the forest to, to have some free time. And uh, one very hot summer, uh, I noticed that uh, the brook that ran through the area was uh, drying out. So uh, I went, uh, I was going back to catch some water and fill up some water bowls for them. Uh, but all of a sudden I noticed that one of the horses was circling in a little area out in the field. And all of a sudden he started to use his uh, front uh, leg pawing. And I was fascinated, so I stood there watching him. And it took some time, but all of a sudden there was water spr sprouting out. He had sensed water in the ground mm. and he dug it out. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. yeah. That's one of my uh, favorite memories of that time. Wow. Yeah, it was that's... so fantastic. They still have it, even so many years of being taken away from everything natural. Mm. 
Isn't that fantastic? So there is this observation that people have made about, you know, animals detecting earthquakes, particularly hoofed animals. And yeah. we know that yeah. the hooves obviously have a rich nerve supply mm. um, and whether or not they can sort of pick up some of these vibrations early on. Um, mm. I got a feeling that in China, they actually have these early warning stations you know, which basically, okay. basically what they are is they're big game parks and they just watch the animals. Mm -hmm. They start mm -hmm. to move in a strange way. They think an earthquake's coming. We've got to be careful. Uh, I was in Japan once and uh, one day, uh, all the dogs, they had a, a huge area with many dogs in different uh, uh, fenced, uh, fenced in areas. And all the dogs started to get very, uh, you know, they were restless, mm. they were howling a bit, and they were quite unusual. Uh, and uh, that night there was an earthquake. Mm. Wow. But they started already in the middle of the day, mm. 12 hours before it actually came. Wow. Yeah. There's, a, there's an awful And lot I we... believe they actually sensed it. I, I really yeah. do. Well, it's, it's one of those things, you know, it's um say so we all live in our own worlds and i think it, it's something that's starting to appear more in the animal behavior field this appreciation that yeah mm. that mm. we all create our own realities and you know I'm, I'm i have a strange form of colorblindness um oh, yeah. and okay. one of the one of the things about it is that um i have difficulty with certain colors but i'm also more sensitive to textures so okay um so you know whilst nobody can explain to me the colors that i can't see because, <laughs> okay <laughs> but it's a, okay. obviously it's a different consciousness and this idea that you know what our senses give us is the real world is a complete sort of non-starter and i know you've, you've you've studied philosophy um but you know your brain presents you with information that through evolution has been advantageous to you. It is not the real world. You know, we know that there's colors in ultraviolet, et cetera, that we don't mm. see, mm. Um, you know, and um, and it's like, I often think, you know, I've got friends who really, I mean, I like a glass of wine, but some of them, you know, really do appreciate wine and the different complexities. And I, I, I you know, it's beyond me, but <laughs> if they can detect all these things in a glass of wine, you know, it is, it's a different type of consciousness. Mm, yep. There's things that I don't detect that they do detect. And that's, you know, they, mm. that, that, and, you know, and I think that recognizing this and, and how, you know, not just between species, you know, the, the world of the dog um, um, and how different it is, but also between individuals. Mm. Um, we did a little experiment a few years ago where we taught the cats um, that they had to find a food reward in a little maze. And the way that we set it up is they could use either a scent cue on the cat flap to sort of different doors in the maze, or they could use um, a visual cue. Now, mm -hmm. much to our surprise, most of the cats um, actually used a visual cue. But, mm. but some of them used the scent cue. And it just got me thinking that I bet you that cat lives in a completely different world to the others. If, if he thinks mm. that, you know, scent is more important than what I can see, I'm sure mm. his brain is presenting him with a very different view of the world. Mm. You know, and I think that, as I said, when we think of dogs and whatever, you know, the information um often we want them to be very visual because we're working with them and we're very visual and, and dogs have yeah. but dogs use their sight uh, first mm. no matter in what situation they are yeah. they see first yeah then you can see it in any dog he walks through a doorway and the moment he is on the threshold you can see him actually check yeah. with one glance mm. what is there uh, so they are very dependent on, I think all of them are. I have never mm. met anyone who didn't. They are dependent on checking, seeing what's going on. And then they push the other senses into uh, action mm. uh, if they want to check out something more. 
That's so interesting to yeah. look at. And that's it. I think, you know, they have this tremendous scent ability. And I know you, you, you've done scent work as well. We'll have to chat about that. Oh. But, oh. but that doesn't mean that that, yeah, as you say, that's not their primary thing. Dogs are very visual because if they're oh. with people, etc., you know, you have to understand people and you look at them. And we've got some work, you know, that suggests that, yeah, dogs look at people's body outlines in order to work out whether mm -hmm. they're worth approaching. They then inspect faces. Interestingly, when they inspect faces, they do it in quite a human way, whereas humans looking at dog faces do that in a human way, not the dog way. So dogs mm -hmm. tend to look at each other's ears. Humans look at each other's eyes. And dogs, when they look at humans, look at their eyes more than their ears. Um, so they, they seem to have got a better hang on how to interpret. We were talking earlier about how to interpret. <laughs> and this is one of the things, you know, dogs are probably better at it than humans. The other, uh, Absolutely. Way. But, they are so good at it. But then, you know, they've got this tremendous ability of scent, which they can choose, I think, to engage in. You know, it's sort of if they want to make the effort. Um, mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, depending it's on It's enormous. The... And I love to do nose work. I always done and all my dogs have been been uh, man trailing and or finding things and stuff because they really love it. And it's amazing. Mm. It you... is amazing. To, but um, also horses. Horses, uh, mm. and th they are never allowed to use their scent, mm. and they are so good at it. Yeah, no, they've got they've got a pretty big um, cribriform plate covered in uh, olfactory receptors. So yeah, they, they yeah. Mm. And, and, you know, I my I was out uh, riding my Arabian many many years ago, and uh, he went with loose reins as usual, and then he went with his nose to the ground, and he started. He it it was very consciously he followed a track, mm. so I let him do that, and he went and he went into the forest with nose on the track, and all of a sudden he stopped up, used his front leg, and killed a snake. Oh wow! He had he had followed the the track of a snake actually. Wow! Isn't that amazing? Yeah, no. Um... I thought this was fantastic. Yeah, I've, I've, no, I've not. I've, I've not heard that before. Um, I, I remember chatting to Sue McDonald once, and she asked me about a a horse that seemed to be killing uh, rabbits in the field. I'm mm. um, trying to work out, and we were trying to work out the reasons why. But um, and it, it wasn't just one rabbit. You know, it did seem that this horse really went after rabbits. I don't know what rabbits Maybe have ever done. Maybe irritated of the rabbits <laughs> jumping around. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Usually, they get well along with the rabbits. Mm, yeah. But as you say, you know, scent work in horses. Um, you but know. you have to let them have a chance of doing it. Mm. Then they don't need to go with their head up all the time. If they want to to sniff at something and look at something, they should be allowed to. Mm. And you know, they are there. Um, their actual, their whole respiratory system is designed to operate best with their heads low down. So, yeah. Yeah, there seem to be, many people seem to uh, think it's scary mm -hmm. when uh, when the horses lower their heads. Uh, they mm. feel probably a little bit unsafe up there. I don't know. Mm. But it's like, I mean? it's, it's, it's like you say, just letting the animals, give the animals the freedom. And there is so much to observe and oh, see. Oh, yeah. And, and yeah. you can discover so many things. That is so great. Um, maybe that's what we really ought to be pushing much more is you know yeah and people say about yeah let the dog be a dog but actually just just give them some space yeah just to do their own thing mm. um and... of course we have to have some good manners in daily life mm. but that's more about teaching them habits uh, than actually training and using control yeah definitely i think oh i, I think i I think I might have the RAF going overhead. I don't know if that's coming through on your side. I have an airplane passing here. I live five minutes from the airport. All right. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, just as I said, just giving that and spending more time. Yeah, maybe people ought to be told that they have to go away for a weekend and just watch dogs before they're allowed to take a dog from a shelter and that sort of they thing. They can come to my center. <laughs> I, when I moved up uh, north uh, and to the Atlantic coast, uh, I was going to retire. 
I'm old enough for that now, but <laughs> I don't feel like retiring because it's too many interesting things yeah. to do in this world. So I bought a um, football field. Oh, yeah, you, and, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, we uh, there was a clubhouse on it, so we have that house for for um, consultations and small seminars and uh, we have this football field where which we uh, use for walking and having dogs out there and uh, it's so enjoyable because at the entrance of the football field we have a big sign where it says command free zone <laughs> what a brilliant <laughs> what a fantastic <laughs> idea and nobody really gets the point because I start to tell the dog to do things and we say, look at the sign, no commands here. <laughs> it's really funny. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that, that, that's brilliant. We need more, much more of that, I think. Um, just sort of, yeah, give them. Um, and if you're worried about your dog in that situation without commands, that itself speaks volumes about the relationship you have with your dog and your dog has yeah, with you. It's says more about you than about the dog actually so yeah yeah but uh, we have managed to teach uh, quite a few people to be a little more relaxed about it and you cannot expect more i think yeah so so one of the other things i know that um and i, I think we've, we've we've chatted about in the past and i don't know how far you got with this was um we sort of we shared a common um, dislike of the way that people test dogs temperament oh yeah and oh my goodness um, yes. and a number of years ago we did a we did a um a sort of demonstration at the royal society in london and we just produced these cards um you know like top trumps did you have top mm. trumps in in norway and we produced these sort of top trump cards on dogs and it was dogs with important jobs mm -hmm. and basically it sort of had something like you know guide dog for the blind and we, then we just sort of made up these things about eight different traits that the dog should be you know on and some of them it would score high on and some of it score low on this sort of thing mm -hmm. and then you got the courthouse dog who you know on things like problem solving didn't have to score very high because he just had to sit in the court but he's still doing an important job and um and one of the things that um when we when we took these along to the uh, exhibition is the school teachers absolutely loved this because they said it, it shows that you know it's not a reject dog it's just about finding mm. the right niche for the dog um and you know they they took loads of these packs to give to the, the school kids and whatever and i know sort of yeah, say when we spoke about this before you sort of yeah people are trying to find what the dog can't do not what the dog can do I developed a, a kind of test, if you can call it that, for dogs many years ago. And I have used it a lot. And uh, really, I think it is as good as anything because uh, it proves that uh, what I find when observing the dog it seems to be uh, right when you look at it afterwards. And the test itself is very simple because all you do is you set up an area uh, with different things in it and maybe people and you just let the dog in and you observe what he's doing. And the most important thing in, uh, in a dog I find is how curious he is because curiosity is a basic of all learning of everything actually if you're not curious you won't you won't get anywhere i'm gonna have to pause you're... i think that's your aircraft going overhead again was it mine is it here the helicopters are busy oh. here <laughs> don't, i don't want people don't to miss this because of the the, the plane noise we don't yeah. i don't think we'll hear so more of this let, let's go so curiosity yeah yeah curiosity is so important and there are so many dogs who are uh, de learned to be curious because people haven't uh, accepted that they were. It's so important that puppies, for instance, are allowed to be curious. Mm. Even if it's, it looks a bit scary, you have to, uh, to pull yourself together and do not 
uh, take away their curiosity in the puppy because they're so easily scared mm. and they stop doing it. Mm. And I don't dare to be curious anymore. And then you've lost something. Yeah, and I, I, you're, you're spot on because if you don't allow them to be curious after they've been scared, they never get over that fear. Um, People should also be more curious. And that is mm. one of the things I realized today uh, that uh, when we have Q&A sessions and so on, there are very few questions. People are not curious to find out things. They don't, uh, they don't read what I give them. <laughs> we have a, a book cafe uh, to, at the center so people can come and look in the, all the books we have there. They mm. never look in them. Yeah, it, there's it, no curiosity in people. Yeah, it, it's it's interesting, isn't it? And I'm I'm intrigued that you say that because yeah, I mean, we talk about that a lot in this country. That you know, I think every child is curious, but our education system seems to have taken the curiosity out yeah. of them. And, yeah, it kills um, it. It kills it. I the same before... way that we kill the curiosity in horses and dogs because mm. uh, we control them all the time. Yeah, but they not the not cat. <laughs> but not the cat. <laughs> My cat is still curious no, and wrecking the you house. Can't, every... You can control a cat that yeah. way. <laughs> so, so yeah. So I mean, but that's that's it. And I I think it's um it goes back to what we were saying about um you know, and I just wonder if it's because there is this culture of control, and by through that culture yeah. of control, we are destroying the curiosity. Yeah. I think so. Um, by you know replacing the intrinsic rewards of curiosity, you know the, the joy of learning, which mm -hmm. uh, you know I know we both have, by sort of replacing it with external rewards. You know, it's all this sort of do this and you'll get you'll get that, and you think as opposed to do this because it's interesting. Mm. Um, and that's you know uh, I remember my. My late mum, she always used to say, you know, the most boring people uh, are the people who say they're bored. Uh, and it's because, you know, go and find a way of entertaining yourself. There were, you know, my mum had five kids pretty much one year after the other. So, you know, she couldn't keep an eye on all of us. I can yeah. never, my mum never told me not to do anything. She just gave me something else to no. do. No. And that's, you know, that was one of her many bits of brilliance, you know, mm. that... She kept that intrinsic interest in mm. learning just for learning's sake. Um, it's the same with me. My parents didn't have time. They were wonderful parents, but they mm. never time to, to see what I was doing. So I did what I wanted to do. Mm. And I, I think that helped me keeping my curiosity. Yeah. Really. And it's, it just means that you can find joy in any, any situation. Mm. There's always mm. something to explore. Um, yeah. And, and because uh, I know it's so healthy and good for people, I know it's the same mm. for for animals as well. Mm. A I mean, they, have the same, they have more or less the same brain as we have. They have yeah. so much in common with us. Well, the default situation that, you know, there's, there's this idea that the default situation of the brain is to sort of switch off. Well, your brain is an active organ. And its mm. default situation is to actually be exploring and gaining information. Um, and, uh, and what do we learn from the neuroscientist Jenny Nyberg again? Mm. It, it's so adaptable. It changes all the time mm. by what we are uh, getting in through mental stimulation, through the senses, uh, by being curious. Mm. And they found out with this uh, ME uh, tests on people that when a person gets curious, the whole brain gets mm. active. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's what we need. We need the brain to be mm. active. Yeah. And it's just, yeah, as you say, I, but I'm just, yeah, I'm just concerned that, as you say, just like children, we've, we're, we're stripping it out from animals as well. And mm. people just need to uh yeah just ease it as you say every dog training center ought to have this no command area where the dogs can just be cured you know <laughs> yeah be allowed to do their own thing um and if, you're, if it's not safe for your dog to do that then you know you need to think about well why isn't it safe and what is the relationship i've got with my dog but um, if we have to secure an area in, of some kind by moving something away or whatever that's okay but uh, it's important to let go of this control thing we have. 
really it's like um I, I think this bit was off air so i'll just say it again you know that, that i started this podcast series because i've been so lucky with the people that i've met and i just have that yeah curiosity and just chat mm. to anybody um mm. and you know people oh you know they're very eminent it doesn't matter that they're eminent they're still a human being and you just chat to them yeah. and, and people have shared their insights etc and um i hope i do the same i mean i, I yeah i well, I really hope I do. Because... It, it, I think it is healthy. I mean, at my age, uh, I am uh, have a lot of physical problems. I'm uh, quite rotten from here and down. <laughs> but as long as this is working, <laughs> yeah. my head is okay. I, I'm happy. So but I it... use my curiosity for all it's worth. Mm. And it's the, the, what I don't like is people's sort of knowledge is power. And you just think, well yes but don't keep it to yourself you know and we should be you know the more I discuss ideas with people and yeah you know I, I, like most people in academia I've discussed things with other people and then seen the experiment done and think oh mm. but to be honest I've got so many other experiments I could do and I didn't get around to doing that it's not the end of the world um and I gain far more by discussing my ideas then mm. I lose by sharing ideas and other people going off with them and doing stuff with it. You know, it's just, yeah. Mm. Um, and it's just a much better way to be much, much more fun. Yeah, I agree. That, it's, that uh, absolutely. So, and there's so, so much interesting to, to uh, look at and try to learn about still. Mm, absolutely. So we have a lot to do. I mean, if I could do more uh, method development, I would do that. I'd love to do that. Mm. It's so interesting to see how you can make things easier and simpler. And I think I want to come on a visit and and, and just spend a week with you in Norway. <laughs> oh, that would be wonderful. Um, there should. We'll just watch this the animals. Area, <laughs> this area is so beautiful. When Rachel Dreisma was here, the the horse woman. Mm. Uh, we had um, we, we I always send people on the eagle safari out here. Oh wow! It's a fantastic uh, area for eagles, mm. and uh, yeah, no, it's a, it's a fabulous area. I've just bought a new wildlife lens for my camera, so um, <laughs> you might find me knocking on your door sooner than you expect. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. That's fine. <laughs> but um, mm. but anyway. I, I guess, as I said, we've, we obviously had to take a break and I'm, I'm conscious of time. So um, as always, it's been such a pleasure to chat to you and I hope we get a chance to catch up before too long. Um, but before we close, is there anything I sort of, I'm, I'm, there's so much I could talk about, but is there anything you want to share with people before we close? I think we've uh, been into some of the most important things because uh, uh, I, have a, I have a soft spot for a curiosity for letting go of control and this sort of thing because there are so much fantastic in animals they are just the, all the years they have learned and developed into survivors mm. they have so much valuable things in them and they should be allowed to to have it yeah absolutely and it's not about it's not about permissiveness it's about letting them learn their place their own way mm and mm. enjoying their life as a result and I, as i said the the joy of these things is i never know how these chats are going to go and this has been such a pleasure to catch up with you and as i said it's just those fun. thoughts and um i hope it won't mm. be too long before we get a chance to catch up either in person that would or, be great yeah. absolutely thank you once again to my guest and to you for listening and also a special thank you to cedric van gronsveld for his editing in making these things come together thanks a lot